Move the minutes. Move the minutes. Thank you. All in favor? And a motion to accept the consent agenda. We've had nothing pulled. Thank you. All in favor? Awesome. So our first presentation. Good meeting, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Mike, and your last name? Corporal. Thank you. From MPAC. I just uh, have a few folios I'd like to deliver with copies of the presentation. And, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members of Council, it's a pleasure uh, to be here to speak with you today and appreciate the invite of uh, coming here today to talk to you about uh, MPAC. And uh, today I'd just like to go through uh, some of the roles and responsibilities of the property assessment system uh, about MPAC, the property assessment cycle, and the about my property uh, product that we have uh, that <coughs> the taxpayers can utilize when they do get their assessment notices in the mail. We've made uh, significant improvements in, in that online ability uh, for taxpayers. Uh, I'll go through the request for reconsideration process and also uh, the avenues for contacting MPAC if, you have, if there's any questions from taxpayers or who wants to give us a call. Uh, so we have uh, the province of Ontario basically takes care of the legislation. They, you know, develop the uh, and are responsible for the Assessment Act and tax policy that uh, MPAC follows and administers. MPAC's role is to accurately value and classify property in the entire province of Ontario. Uh, currently, we're up uh, words of uh, five million properties that we are valuing. The Assessment Review Board is uh, appointed uh, by the Ministry of Attorney General. There's a chair of the board there. They adjudicate and they hear uh, taxpayers' concerns when they appeal their assessments to the Assessment Review Board. And on the taxation and municipalities use our assessments to send tax bills uh, to taxpayers. And, and provincially, in the uh, PLT area up in the north, the province uses our values as well to, uh, to send tax bills to taxpayers. So about NPAC, we're a not-for-profit, non-share capital corporation. We're governed by a board of directors. Uh, we have 15 uh, board of directors and uh, eight are municipal representatives. 
five are taxpayer representatives and two are provincial uh, representatives. We are the largest assessment jurisdiction in North America. We have, again, we have over five million properties. So there's a, definitely a lot of values that uh, we are responsible for. So again, we assess five million properties. We provide an annual assessment roll to municipalities and it's the second Tuesday in December. So on an annual basis, we also are responsible for supplementary and limited listings where we go out uh, typically in each municipality, depending on how it, it works, we have sort of three rounds where we actually supply supplementary and omitted sub roles to the municipality to add in-year assessment growth as a result of new homes being constructed, additions, these sorts of things. We also respond to taxpayer inquiries. Um, if someone wants to submit a request for consideration or there's an issue or a correction with their property or in general just want to learn a little more about assessment, um, so we respond to all kinds of inquiries and I personally deal with and work with municipal staff and dealing with many of the things uh, in, in that event. Um, we have other uh, legislative products. We uh, provide the preliminary list of electors to uh, municipalities when there's uh, an election year, uh, jury duty lists, and population reports for jury duty. Fair value assessment um, is basically, it's based on open market sales between willing seller and willing buyer. So it's an open market sale. We don't include family sales, power <coughs> sales, foreclosures. Okay, it, again, it comes down to willing buyer, willing seller. We analyze the market. We receive all the sales that go through the registry office, whether they go through MLS or their private sales. We review all the sales. So it's strictly the open market sales that determine the values and we're there, we, we interpret the market and that is how the values are arrived at. The assessment cycle, uh, currently we are in the update year of 2008. So all the values at this point are still based on uh, January 1st, 2008. And that has now come to an end. We're at the end of 2012. And we're moving now into evaluation base date of January 1st, 2012. So effective January 1st, 2013, there will be a new assessment base in place and for all the properties in the province. And just uh, further on that last note, um, for um, the assessment notice mailings for those new assessments, are expected to commence the end of this month and carry on through a staggered approach all the way till November. <coughs> so it is looking like in this area, early October, uh, we'll be commencing mailing of the property assessment notices with the new valuation date of January 1st, 2012. And just to give you an example about the uh, phases. So what happens is, is just as an example, uh, we have a property with a value as of January 1st, 2008, with the assessment cycle, we're just coming out of 300,000. There's a new assessment that is placed on the property, effective January 1st, 2012, that brings it to 360,000. So basically, that net difference of 60,000 is phased in the next four years. So you can see by starting in 2013, there'll be the first phase in increment, and it's 15,000 every year. So again, it's phased in every year till it's reached the 2012 current value assessment of 360,000. Uh, I touched on this about the About My Property. This was a, a huge uh, initiative for us. Uh, we've made significant improvements. Um, all taxpayers who get an assessment notice uh, will have an access key and uh, assessment role identifier that they can actually go online and view and access uh, information on their property and other properties in the area. So basically this is the login screen where you would actually go put in the user ID and password that is available on your assessment notice and basically you will have a profile uh, page come up that um, the other change here with this is that um, with this profile page, 
some property owners have multiple properties that they own, so they can enter these in so that they don't have to have two separate accounts. It's all within one account. So basically, all the criteria could be set up here, uh, email addresses and these sorts of things. Okay, so there, again, just a, an idea of what the uh, profile account looks like and if there's multiple properties owned by the property owner. Again, the property list that they have. So the other big improvement that we have here is um, we've added some imagery. So we have imagery there um, of property. So um, we have the subject property. Um, you'll see where the location is on the map with an image of the property, as well as when we go through the process and they start selecting comparable properties, again, there's imagery associated with those properties of interest. And the other improvement that we have this year is the ability for the property owners to print their assessment notices that they just received in the mail. If, you know, they, if it's been misplaced or whatnot, um, they can actually view their notice and, and print them off right on the spot, as well as any subsequent notices uh, that the property owner may receive. Um, they can print them off and, and review. So there's a bit of a history there now that on a go forward, it's going to be built up that they can have access to. Okay, and again, I just talked about the property assessment notice and again, the ability to print it off. Okay, so then uh, going through the, the process here, um, we have uh, the property profile of the subject property that the taxpayer has gone into, and it allows the ability to confirm uh, the information we have on record and make corrections to our database. So we have this feature. It's interactive now where, you know, we're looking at this too as an opportunity to, uh, you know, update our data, uh, correct the data on the spot, and we're actually interacting with the taxpayer. Okay, and just giving you an idea of when the property owner can view up to 100 properties of, you know, at, at, uh, within any time. So, and they can select up to 24 properties of interest so that this whole premise is that they have the ability to kind of reconcile how does their property fare out and is it equitable with other similar properties in their area. And again, with associated imagery uh, on there so that you know it's better they have a better understanding so the properties of interest you can see will be across the top and then it's laid out in, in an actual comparable report that can be saved and printed off the other avenue here as well is there's an, the opportunity for the request for consideration to be submitted through the about my property uh, website as well so depending on the notice that is received by the property owner the avenue is there now to submit it on the spot and also identify and submit the comparables to us so we know exactly what they're looking at and what the issues are. So for on the request for reconsideration uh, side, the uh, mandatory first step for residential farm and managed forest properties is the request for reconsideration. Okay, so that's the first step and you know, uh, contacting MPAC to review the assessments. And then after our review, which we uh, attempt to uh, you know, complete within 90 days of receipt, we have to complete all uh, requests for reconsiderations within the tax year by September 30th of that year. So at that point at our completion, if there is, uh, you know, um, a, a, a not an agreement on or you know, a confirmation of value, then the taxpayer at that point can submit an assessment uh, appeal to the assessment review board. Okay, and the filing deadline for both the uh, appeal and the request for consideration is March 31st of the taxation year. We have a number of brochures which I have included in each of the folios that we provided today. Um, it speaks about many of the different property types. Um, perhaps you know, some of your uh, constituents may be calling you about their assessment notices. 
and there's a number of brochures available that we have available. Um, also, with the uh, our outreach initiatives and the about my property uh, product that we have, we have um, contacted all the libraries, and they've added the link <coughs> that if a property owner is going to the library, they can actually access uh, their property information at the library. So that's been adopted in all the libraries in, in the region of Durham. So that's another avenue for taxpayers to go. They can contact us um, on our website. They can call us. Uh, they can come visit our office. Our office is located in the Oshawa Center um, in the office Galleria. So, and they can fax the information to us. They can uh, send information in the about my property to us. So there's many avenues where uh, taxpayers can call us to talk about their assessment. And that's the end of my presentation today. And if there's any questions that I could answer, I'm more than happy to. Thank you. Councilor, Councilor Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, Mr. Corporal. Um, thanks for your presentation. I just have a question on how you deal with, usually if you have a subdivision, most of the houses are similar value. Where, like for instance, where I live, where Council Brown lives, down by the lake, we've got the sort of the one development, and then one street over, Pickering Beach Road, you've got houses that are three, four, five hundred thousand dollars higher in value, and that's one street. And then one street over the other way, Crawford, same thing. How do you deal with situations like that so the higher values on the adjacent streets don't sort of skew the numbers on the other houses? Yeah. Basically, what we would have is we would look at Typically, if there's, say, two separate subdivisions nearby and if there's a waterfront, what have you, we would look at, we would likely isolate those subdivisions. So it would basically be the sales that are occurring in those subdivisions is what we would use to arrive at the values. And the five top things that uh, make up your assessment are your lot size, your location, your house size, quality construction, and the age of your home. So those are the top five uh, items that make up 85% of the value. So when we look at the sales in that area, and if they are abutting waterfront properties, there, uh, there they may be an adjustment to be on waterfront. There may be an adjustment to be on a busy street as well. And these uh, uh, detractions and additions are uh, tested and evaluated through the sales that dictate the values. So we're interpreting the market um, again, within these subdivisions, there may be similar models involved as well. So I would expect that if there's a similar model in the same subdivision that would be comparable to each, they should have relatively equal assessments. So that's basically, it's the sales that, are, that is driving the information. And there are different variables, additions and deletions that may alter the values uh, slightly. Okay, well that leads to my next question. What happens when, and again, in, in this neighborhood where you've got somebody, I don't know what they were thinking, overpaid by eighty hundred thousand dollars on a house. A house sold for two ninety. Three months later, it was on the market for four ninety nine. Yes. And it sold for four sixty five. The highest value of a house on that street ever was three seventy nine, up until this summer. Now all of a sudden, there's a whole rash of sales on the street. Everybody's got their houses for four, four fifty, whatever. Nothing's selling. How do you deal with that? Basically, uh, it's one sale doesn't make the market, so it would be a grouping of sales that we would look yeah. at and, and determining the value. Okay, so we wouldn't we wouldn't hone in on the one <coughs> sale per se. And again, what we have done is we have done uh, sales investigations, so we do have an idea of let's say if there was a, a sale in that nature, mm -hmm. we'd be looking at the assessment to sale ratio there, and it would seem rather high compared to the assessment, let's say, and we would want to go and have a look to see what was there at the time of sale. So that's how we would, we would address something like that, but it, to answer the question is the one sale wouldn't, wouldn't be establishing the values. Okay. It's, it's a grouping of the sales. However, if all these other new listings do sell for their asking price, that's going to start really affecting things. Again, yeah, on the go for it, perhaps with the next reassessment okay. cycle, um, it may have an impact on the, on the, you know, the assessment because it's, the assessments are driven by the market, mm -hmm. right? And that's basically you know, what, what we're looking at. And we look at, and again, we also see the, the tool that we have about my property as an avenue to correct data. There may be some instances where we haven't been to a property 
in a little while. There has been some changes there that we're not aware of. So that avenue, the interaction with the taxpayer, is critical for us to, uh, you know, to look at and gain, uh, you know, accurate data on property. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? That's all right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. In the Pickering Beach area, we, it's being, being revamped. People are buying cottages and pulling them down and putting up million dollar homes. So that really affects the cottage owner. Uh, so do you make allowances? I mean, I heard what you said, but all but this, this the house applies to them. So they've been saving their taxes very considerably, I would think. Yes. Uh what we would do there, there likely would be a building permit, I, I believe, that would be taken out for the, the demolition of the old property with the new uh, house being built. Um, in that case, you know, the values would be looking at similar properties of, of similar size in that area. So we would we, we'd go in there basically utilizing that information and any other criteria that that property may have, whether it has waterfront view or you know, it's on a busy street, or a quiet street, or it's a budding commercial property. We look at all the characteristics that make up that property, and basically, all we can do is arrive at that value based on the what the sales have told us in that area. But I'm not talking about the ones that are rebuilt. I'm talking about the cottage that is still there. They're not planning to tear it down. Oh, I see. So that They're exists, really, yeah. Yes. So basically, typically, they, they may be um, older homes, um, cottage type properties that okay. you know if, if they're you know, they're well maintained and whatnot so basically yeah their values uh, there would be an increase in the value valuation there but the criteria of their homes the age again I touched on the five things the age of their home the size of their home and quality of construction would still play a factor in the value of that property so the age of the home if it was built in you know 1920 or 1930 and uh, you know the quality of construction would be say a cottage uh, type property the valuation would still be representative however um, from a location standpoint these other you know, larger homes may there may be it's a location thing as well so but the characteristics of that structure will be intact and will be play a, a huge part in that value thank you uh, generally I, when I get these calls I say, if you look at your assessment and you think you can sell your house for that amount, or it's usually less than what you ask for it, then you don't have anything to appeal. If it is, is more than what you think you can sell your house, appeal immediately. Is that? Yes, yeah, so I think the first, you know what, we're, we assess 5 million properties. Yeah. And I'm not going to say to you that everything is 100% here. There's, there's going to be some where we may have incorrect data. And I just want to say to everyone here that we do have a process in place that if uh, you know one of the taxpayers does have an issue and feels that their value is too high, the first thing would be to call us or go to the About My Property website. Call us, talk to us. We're, you know, we can review the facts and see whether, in fact, you know, there may be an error that we've made on that assessment. But I want to say to you that we're, we're fully prepared to you know, correct the property if there is an error. Thank you. Thank you. Those are my questions. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your support. Oh, oh, just so I can, Madam Chair, very quickly. So in addition to the work that MPAC's going to do, we're going to run a couple ads on the community page over the next few weeks as well, too, as well as put some links on our website. But I think the key thing message to council to take away is if people do have questions on their, you know, about their assessment, they need to go to MPAC. If they, you know, if they come to us at this town tax staff, we're not assessors, so just really, and that will be the gist of our communications as well, too, is anything should go directly to the impact. So we'll include that information, say, on our website as well as on the, uh, uh, the community page. But any questions regarding assessment should go right directly to impact and not to, to town staff. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. We have a new pictorial book. <laughs>
afternoon, Mayor, members of Council. Um, I'm here this afternoon to talk to you about a new initiative that we have, and this is the creation of a new town of Ajax history book. Now, you're all familiar with our current history book, The Town Called Ajax. It was first printed in 1995, and while it provided an excellent account of the history of Ajax, it was very text heavy. We did reprint 7,000 copies in 2004 at a cost of $76,000. We currently have under 150 books left in our inventory. Now we've got a couple of big milestones coming up in the next couple of years. 75th anniversary of the Battle of the River Plate in 2014, 60th anniversary of the incorporation of the town of Ajax in 2015, and the 75th anniversary of the creation of the Defense Industries Limited in 2016. With the receding um, supply of our current Town of Ajax books, there was a discussion with whether or not it was feasible to reprint our current book. But it was felt that this was a wonderful opportunity to look at creating a new book. And to use a somewhat different format that was used in the town called Ajax. Now, I'm not sure if most of you are aware, the first actual history book um, produced was a pictorial history book. And this was uh, published in 1972. This book, as well as our current history book, were created and driven by the Ajax Historical Board. Now in 2001, the Ajax Historical Board and the Local Architectural Conservancy Advisory Committee were merged to form the Ajax Heritage Advisory Committee. The archival holdings of those two committees were then transferred over to the town. And the Ajax Archives was created based on that. The role and mandate of the Ajax Heritage Advisory Committee has changed considerably since the last book was printed. And with staff now assuming responsibility for the archives and, and primarily uh, the archivist position as far as the holding is concerned, it was felt that this project would be better suited under the guidance and direction of, of a staff steering committee. And one was created in December 2011. Now, the members of this committee are Mary Lou Murray, Christy McLarty, David Frege, Christy Kress, as well as myself. The Ajax Heritage Advisory Committee will be engaged to assist with the historical and heritage components of this project. And staff from various departments have been enlisted to assist with this project. And we will also be contacting and asking for assistance from the other advisory com uh, committees, as well as uh, community organizations. Now these other bodies will be asked to assist in the collection of material, trying to put both photos together, um, historical content, and so forth. Now the book that we're proposing now is going to have similar content to what has been in the previous books. But of course, the primary difference that we're looking at is the telling of our history in photos rather than in text. So the sections of the book, of course, are going to contain the historical component, um, including Defense Industries Limited, University of Toronto Ajax Campus, HMS Ajax, the uh, Belt Heritage, Pickering Village, Pickering Beach, oddly. But we're also going to focus on more current or recent events. So we're going to have sections that include um, the visits of the veterans in 1999 and 2009, as well as street dedications attended by veterans and families of veterans. We're going to highlight our waterfront parks and trails, as well as natural history. We're also going to have a section on our arts, culture, and public art. We're going to highlight our town facilities and lead certification initiatives, as well as our future facilities. And we'll also have a section uh, highlighting cultural change in Ajax and our environmental sustainability initiative. Now, in looking at 
how this new book is going to look when we're finished. We actually are going to use a publication that was done by the Pickering Township Historical Society in 2000. So we are proposing a soft cover. We're estimating that our book is going to have about 250 pages, and we're also considering um, having this available in an e-book format. or chapter of this book will have a summary at the beginning to provide context or background. So we're looking for at least a couple of paragraphs, possibly up to two pages. So it isn't going to be just photos. We are going to try to kind of come out with the best of both. So we're going to have the text as well as the photos. We were impressed with the layout of what was done by the Pickering Historical Society, the the content, the format, and we want to try to create something similar to that. And the book is going around so you can have a look at it. So our next steps, steps with this project, well, the concept for this new book was approved by management in June of this year. And staff have been engaged to assist in collecting the photos and the text with the various select uh, chapters or, or uh, contents. Now, the steering committee is still doing the due, due diligence on this project, but it is estimated that the cost of this book is going to be between forty and fifty thousand dollars, and a cost justification will be included in the 2013 budget. In order to have this book ready for the visit of the veterans in 2014, the goal is to have the book in print early 2014, and to meet this timeline. The task of collecting the photos in Texas has already been started, and we're hoping to have that component completed by December of this year. Preliminary editing will be done in the spring of 2013, and we'll be looking at hiring an editor to assist with finalizing the content, and a designer and publisher will be hired for the final component of the project. Now, we currently have over 2,600 photos in the HIV. So we have more than enough material to pull on to highlight our history. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us to use these photos, many of which the public hasn't been able to see. So with the assistance of staff, the advisory committees, and the other uh, community organizations, this new book will provide a snapshot of the history, the development of Ajax, and what has been accomplished as a community as well as a municipality. Thank you. Can't wait to see it. Any questions? Councilor Brown. Thank you. I noticed they have sponsorship down the sides. Are, are we going to seek sponsors or? Uh, we hadn't really gotten into that. We are looking right now on the possibility of Because they must have had different levels of as diamonds and copper and uh, different levels of sponsorship. But that book, not on every page, but uh, that was done by the actual historical society. It wasn't done by uh, by people. I wonder why they just uh, <laughs> mentioned the mayor and Doug Dickerson. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He said the Heritage Committee would be involved. To what extent? I guess my feeling is I wouldn't want them to be involved more or less at the end of the process. I would like them involved at the beginning. How are, how are, what's their link with the staff committee? Or is there a wrap on the staff committee from the Heritage <coughs> Committee? Or? Um, actually, kind of works the other way. I'm a staff liaison with the Heritage Committee. So actually our meeting in September, I took a number of the finished uh, chapters that have already been put together 
based on what we had in the archives and material that I've pulled together over the last couple of years for our displays. And I've actually given that material all to the uh, advisory committee members. So they're helping us with the editing, with um, finalizing the content. We'll also use them to help us make the selection as to what will eventually go in. So we have, I think, more material than what we can actually put into this book. So there is going to have to be a selection process. Staff that have been asked to participate in this were selected because of their expertise or knowledge in certain areas that we want to highlight in the book. And they have also been encouraged to work with the other advisory committees and or um, community organizations if they feel there's going to be a benefit to getting involved in this. That's, that's good to hear. Um, it sounds like they're involved at the beginning and as well. I think the other areas that you spoke of, um, for example, the diversity, any of the issues around environmental and trails, I hope that they come in early in the process, those advisory committees, so that they can have uh, their comments incorporated, their thoughts. I just think we'll end up with a better final result when I know it might take a little longer, but I think it'd be worth it to do that. And as far as the e-books, I think it has to be. It can't be we might. It, it has to be because I certainly that's the way I read now and I know that most of the people I know are starting to so I think it does need to be done and available electronically. I don't know if there's a way you can charge for it. I guess some of Well that's that one is. of the things we've been debating as far as we read into the book aspect and we are still going to have a certain number of hard copies that will be available. Books, we're still working around the pros and cons and, and how that's going to be. Well, I think when you think um, once it's produced, how long it's going to be available, I think that it'll be, um, I mean, there will be people who want hard copies, but I think definitely with the ebook, and particularly for students and so on, that's how we do everything nowadays. So I think that we, we really need. Oh, it's great. Good news. And everybody else is involved. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Ashby? Uh, through you, um, I, I just to reiterate, um, to, just to ensure that the, um, the advisory committees, they are given an opportunity for some meaningful input and that it's not a situation where it, it's almost done and, and you're presented it to these, um, to these committees. So I just want to ensure that they will have that opportunity to, uh, to comment and um, their, their comments and so forth are taken into consideration prior to us finalizing this. this Thank you. Councillor Dennis? But just so Council knows, uh, the Heritage Advisory Committee has had input on a couple of areas they feel, felt have been missed in the, in the past in the other book, perhaps because there wasn't a, a lot of information. And there were two areas in particular they commented on last time. One was the new information we have on the open circle, mm -hmm. and the other area was on the displaced persons camp that was here as well. So I just want to ensure that those are going to be included as much as possible. They felt that that was an important part of history. They haven't really had a, a lot of information on the past. I don't know if you want to give council a quick sort of update on the working circle because I don't believe they know. Uh, okay, well, through the development process, we became aware of an area in North Pickering, right around Church Street and Rosin Road, where there were some old buildings there, and the origins of those buildings weren't well known. Uh, we did some research on that property. It turns out that that area was actually, there was two areas. It was the Workman Circle Colony, as well as the Young Belt Camp. And the camp was actually the first Jewish camp established in Canada in 1924, and it ran until the, the mid-70s. Now the camp was sold, uh, I don't know my dates exact, but I think it was in the 70s the camp was sold, but the cottages were sold at a later date. The 
cottages were basically, it was Jew Jewish families that belonged to the Workman Circle organization, and it was a summer resort area for them. So there, there's a long-standing history to that area, which even myself, I hadn't been aware of until we started this project. I wasn't aware there was any left. Getting burned down. I just want to make a point. You have in the, you had your uh, presentation up. You had Hallway Point Gardens. The change of that tree is done. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Do you need a motion on this at all or just to uh, authorize it to proceed or anything? Or? To receive. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is mine, so I'm going to ask if uh, Councillor Ashby would chair. Is that okay? <laughs> um, so the next item is to do with an issue that I've been, we've been dealing with and residents have been dealing with in, uh, in my area. And so um, it's been ongoing now. I think this would be the anniversary to one year, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken and not when we're celebrating. So it's becoming very stressful amongst the residents uh, of this particular area. So I'd like to ask staff to prepare a report that studies uh, whether tow trucks should be allowed in uh, to park or be in residential area zoned properties and recommendations and any amendments to the town zone bylaw, zoning bylaw that might be helpful. So I'm asking that that report be brought back to us. Uh, I'm not sure. Does um, does that come back to here or to council? GTC. Come back here. to GTC. Okay. Okay. Are, are there any questions? Are you finished? Mm -hmm. Are there any questions from members of council? I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Hannon and Andrew Boyle a couple of questions. Okay. <coughs> Um, I'm sure you've done a little bit of research into this matter. Do other municipalities have uh, tow truck bylaws? Through the chair, we're only aware of, of two others. The city of Guelph mm -hmm. prohibits tow trucks. And All tow trucks? Correct. Mm -hmm. And the, the city of Oshawa limits the amount of commercial vehicles to one, including tow trucks on any residential property. Thank you. Well, when you do your report and recommendations, I would hate to put this small businessman out of a place to park his vehicle, and, and I would steer more to to one vehicle. Um, and I don't know about the rest of council, but I think I would like that option because I wouldn't want to put a, a single tow truck out of business. Um, but I, but I sympathetic of what's going on in the village and uh, so and that shouldn't be allowed either so uh, that was my point through the chair if we we've been cautioned by the town solicitor as well currently our zoning bylaw regulates by size nothing more than a one ton capacity vehicle is permitted on a residential property if we get in to start limiting vehicles by use mm -hmm. today it's tow trucks or it may be Rogers vans, and, and, and it could be Town of Ajax trucks on residential properties for individuals that are on on-call. When we start limiting by, by use of vehicles, uh, right now, currently, we have a bylaw that applies equally and fairly to all residential properties in town by weight. So how, do, how can we deal with this problem that uh, they're having in Pickham? By, by regulating and, and stopping specific used vehicles may actually create more issues on, on neighboring streets and other communities that we're dealing with. Um, they are permitted to park one ton less capacity vehicles. It's a pickup truck that has a, a hitch on the back. There are far larger vehicles on the surrounding streets in this neighborhood that are parking on residential properties. Cube vans are bigger than, um, than these mm -hmm. tow trucks. I don't know that whether there's a perceived problem on the street, one or two neighbors may not be, be happy with looking at it, but that, that may not be the entire street's view that there is an issue on the street. We know when we, we sought feedback on the parking requirements, mm -hmm. we had many, many residents on the street saying that they did not have an issue with what was occurring. Okay. Um, 
I don't know what, what's going to be uh, gained by the report, but I think I would like to see it because it's been a real problem for over a year now. So we have to find a solution to it. Um, just before we uh, take any more questions, um, Councillor Crawford, what, what's the nature of the complaints you're, you're receiving from your, from your residents? I think if, if it had been limited to one tow truck, we would not be sitting here today. The issue is if there are three on the property most times. Most, most of the time it's two and it's gone to three. And at one point there were seven on the street at once. Um, the issue is I don't... I'm not sure what they're running out of their home, but they don't work for a company, so they end up scanning the police uh, radio. And so it means that in at all hours of the morning, day, weekends, whatever, if there's a call, it's not one diesel truck starting up, it's three. It's not one backup beeping, it's three. And it's not ever at a specific time, it's at random times during the, the it's not about, we're not interested in, in, in making them not have a business or not make a living. Certainly that isn't the intent of anybody on the street. The intent is that um, it's, it's a noise issue and it's, it's a problem just because they can't sleep. There's people that work varying shifts on the street that have been complaining about it. Um, I want to say, first of all, Bylaw and myself have been intimate on this particular issue. We don't, I don't think there's a weekend or an evening or a day when Derek and I aren't emailing back and forth or Christine. I mean, you guys have practically lived on the street. And we ended up, we were abiding by the three, the three hour um, rule for parking, which was quickly uh, figured out and actually ended up wasting more time for bylaw because of the chalking and the having to go back. Uh, ended up having to put no stop, no parking on the street itself, period. Which, yeah, limited the, obviously the parking but caused other issues the for, the other, for the other residents. So I, I, it was a temporary fix and so we needed, you know, we need to address it before, <coughs> you know, <coughs> certainly it just needs to be addressed. Again, if it had been one, tow truck, there would never be an issue. It's the three, it's the seven, it's the four, it's, it's, those are the issues. Um, was that your question? I was actually going to offer the same clarification. That, that was my understanding. It's more of business being operated from that residence and, and the noise at four in the morning and the, the diesels and the backup sensors and then all the rest. So pretty much exactly it is. It's not just a one-off. I've got I've got a tow truck on my street. I don't even know it's there. Exactly. You know, it's not a problem. But here, operating the business with several, it, it is a problem. Well, just just a comment. I, I think I think we do need the report, and I don't know if it's focused strictly on tow trucks. I think it needs to <coughs> perhaps focus on what what really concerns us and makes our phones ring and our emails light up and that is nuisances that, that, that you know during a working day fine uh, three o'clock in the morning not fine uh, the other thing is I think that you know we've always encouraged in this community I think home-based businesses I think in a difficult economy home-based businesses tend to be proliferate because of people's economic needs and the, the difficulty of finding commercial space and paying for it etc etc but I do think and, and I don't know what the current state of our regulation is off the top of my head, but I do think we need to start shaping when we say to somebody, okay, you've incubated in your home. It's, it's, it, you've reached the threshold that it's time for you to move on. You've got eight customers coming to your house every day. Uh, you know, there's nuisance factors happening. And I think we need to, and perhaps a zoning bylaw or something is, is the, the tool to do that. Um, and I and you know I sympathize with Mr. Hannon. It's, it's it's not a difficult thing to tackle because it spills over into a whole bunch of things, and you you know you solve one problem, you create two down the street. Uh, but I do think there's a number of issues that we do need to take a look at because I don't think the types of problems that you're encountering are are one-offs are going to go away. Thank you, Councilor. Well, I'm glad. 
the discussion because that's what I wanted to get at was what was the actual issue. And I, I don't think that the, the needs apply to just tow trucks and, and maybe that's what I would be asking, that you look at everything, the property standards, home business, all those things, and see where is it <clears throat> that we have a gap that needs to be addressed to uh, to deal with situations like this, because I, it must be difficult for anyone living nearby, and um, doesn't seem like we have anything right now or anything that anyone can come up with, but to look at it and if there is a gap, we need to address it so that things like this aren't impeding the neighbor's enjoyment of their property. So I'll look forward to that report. Through the chair, we actively investigate home-based business issues, too big, uh, spilling out onto storage on the property. In this particular case, none of the vehicles are registered to anybody who lives in the house. They are all registered to a business address. All they're doing is operating no different than the Rogers person bringing the vehicle home. The business is not being run. There's no registered business at the property. They're just using the vehicles as forms of transport. Uh, that's the issue that we've been dealing with. If the business was registered to the house, we would be able to use the zoning bylaw and eliminate that use from residential property. But in this case, they're just using the vehicles for transport. No, but Mr. Hannon, isn't, maybe I've got this wrong, but isn't one of the reasons that they're using the vehicles for transport, as you say, is that the street in question, the residence in question, is very near to and very accessible to the 401 at West. It, 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 they're actually living in the house that their mother owns that has owned it for 20 years. Okay. So I, I don't think the location has been a key factor. I think prior to even the kids being there, they've lived in, in that house. Now the mother has moved away and the kids have taken it over. But certainly it would be you're gonna get you're gonna get your chance so <laughs> it would be it would be it would those types of locations would tend to attract that more would they not i mean i mean the, 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 you wouldn't find something like that the probability of something like that occurring in an area that was not close to an accessible to a 401 interchange would, would probably be much much less i think that's got to be a Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, did you want to have a you come up and say your name, your address? Hi. My name is John Stock. I live at Seven Adley Crescent, right next to the affected house. Your worship. I hadn't planned on actually speaking today, but you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, the fact that uh, the uh, I think it was Robert's in error, the uh, people who are living at that house. Uh, the one is a uh, son of the boyfriend of the uh, owner of the house. Okay. Uh, when Shirley moved away, Shirley was a good neighbor for 18 years. We've known her, okay, the owner of the house. And she moved away. She decided to operate the place as a source of income after <coughs> renting it. Okay. So she had uh, her um, boyfriend's son had a uh, business running these tow trucks. Now, the tow trucks themselves are what's called chasers, okay? And what they do is a person is on the 401, whatever, okay, there's a breakdown, and they are called in for uh, whatever purpose because the person hasn't got CAA or whatever. They uh, are uh, then at the mercy of whoever is available, okay? Uh, the chasers will be there for their business on the, on the truck themselves, and uh, that's $350 right there, okay? The person is picked up by a chaser might get away for maybe under $700 if you're lucky by the time things are very limited business. Uh, the boys there, they, they are actually, they move in. There's three, there were three of them at the time that were uh, actually doing this business. <coughs> okay, so the one uh, guy and his uh, two, <coughs> two other guys. And uh, they were doing it, essentially it's to make ends meet, it's not a problem, okay? We don't have a problem with that, except for the fact that they were using that particular location because of the proximity to the 401 as a convenient <coughs> uh, location for basing their businesses in, okay? And yes, we had, three tow trucks for the belt of the year, okay, up to some time set, depending on you know, what was coming around there. Um, yeah, they came at any time of the night or day. The radios were left on, okay, because they had to get their business, okay. If they weren't out there chasing cars that were broken down, they weren't making money, okay. 
Uh, recently, they have uh, backed off on their activities, okay. but this has still left the possibility open that they can come back and repopulate the street with their tow trucks. The town has put in temporary parking restrictions on the street. That helped to reduce Okay, sorry. Help to reduce the, uh, the appeal of the street for these guys because they can't have their girlfriends over. You know, they'll, they'll get ticketed, or whatever. They can't have their trucks park in the street. And uh, generally speaking, they were they were they made it more uncomfortable. So they have temporarily gone to other other venues of employment. But again, uh, as of you know two days ago, I saw a tow truck there. So you know, it could come back. It could come back any time. Uh, three tow trucks parked on a, on a house next to you is, is not very appealing. Having uh, you know parking restrictions placed on your street is not a good thing because you can't have your friends over, you can't have, have over uh, your family, whatever. It's become a real issue, and, and we've had a lot of people that are upset. Uh, again, you know, backing out at all times of night and day, okay, causing a hazard because they have to get away to the 401 quickly in order to make that pickup. They have to make the hookup. So anyway, it's, it's a very, very unpleasant situation we've been going through on our street for the last year. And uh, I kind of expected there would be more people here, but I was the only one that was able to get away. Okay, thank you, um, Councillor. Um, so I, I was just going to mention, uh, are you aware that the, the uh, reason of Durham has just recently undergone a, a change in the communication system to a secure network that's no longer um, these police scanners will not work anymore. Okay, that's probably why you've seen things slow down. Okay, because they're not able to access the police van anymore, given, I don't know if the whole thing has been done, the whole transition, I don't think it has. Maybe Mr. Black can... No, no, it hasn't. It hasn't? Okay, no. but I see that as being a, a fix coming down the road, because if they can't get access to the radio signals, they're not going to know who to chase. So, so that's something that may become that may help this situation in the not too distant future. On a personal level, I never had any problem with the boys. If they wanted to drive their cars in and out, you know, go to an impound yard or whatever. But having a tow truck on your street and backing out all hours of the night and day and in a hurry, because they, like I said, they have to go. Now, yeah, with the, with the reduction in, in communication, I'm not sure if they would have a spotter at that point, but there's a possibility. I would like to have myself have a bylaw saying tow trucks. And I'm not saying that, you know, commercial vehicles and whatnot. I know that, you know, you probably have you know, people going home. We have people on our street that have larger trucks, okay, and they operate them respectfully. Okay, they operate them without causing a lot of noise. They keep them up in good shape. And I have no problem with anybody, you know, earning a living out of the house these guys are renting. Okay, they were using it as a base of operations. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? From the okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. So, so um, you have a That's motion. Made your motion. Yeah. Okay. Um, any comments, questions on that motion? Um, all in favor of that motion? Okay. Good. That motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this item with respect to the uh, proposed electoral boundaries, as, as everybody knows, I'm sure that the uh, proposed boundaries for the uh, readjustment uh, prior to the next election have been issued. Um, the boundaries uh, are somewhat controversial in some parts of the region, as regional councillors in particular will know, um, especially in the northern part, I think in Clarington and the north primarily, the boundaries have been such that uh, some of the northern municipalities are affiliated with uh, Halliburton, uh, part of Clarington is affiliated with Port Hope, and there's a feeling that uh, there's not a community of interest, and, and the region yesterday voted to um, put together a task force consisting of the re uh, regional chair and interested mayors to put a submission into the uh, <coughs> boundary commission when it sits locally in in I think November. I think the submission request has to be put in October 1st. Um, I attended the finance meeting along with Councillor Collier and Councillor Jordan. Um, I basically voiced the opinion that Ajax was really quite happy with the boundary readjustment. I mean, 
the new riding is Ajax, the, the, uh, the uh, contiguous with our actual uh, legal boundary. Um, obviously, there's a community of interest. Obviously, Ajax over the years has been divided between being part of a Whitby riding, part of a Pickering riding, etc., etc., etc. Our population is just above what the, the key number is, about 106,000, we're at about 110. Um, and so basically, I, I, in, in light of what the region is doing and saying they don't like some of the boundaries, um, I thought it was important that Ajax, at the very least, uh, at least pass a resolution to, uh, to notify the uh, boundary uh, commissioner, I don't know their exact legal name, um, that we were content with, with the draft. And I think, Marty, you circulated the draft. Just to yourself, in terms of suiting uh, what you might want to do. But uh, you said that the council would endorse the, uh, the, the, the... Marty has drafted a resolution that uh, basically says the Council of the Town of Ajax endorses the Federal Electoral Boundaries Commission for the Ontario, for Ontario recommendation for a single electoral district that matches the boundaries of the Town of Ajax and that the Commission in the Region of Durham be so advised. So I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, if it's appropriate that that resolution be brought forward to Monday's uh, council meeting just to be passed and, and endorsed as our position. So that's why this is on the agenda and I just want to get your feedback on that. Everybody's good with that? <laughs> Let Madam Chair, I'll move that that uh, resolution be put on the agenda for uh, <laughs> Make the motion here to become as a recommendation for this committee. As okay, yeah. I will move that uh, that resolution. Um, I don't think I need to speak to it. Any other any questions at all? No. All in favor? Excellent. Thank you. Do we have any departmental? I have one item I'd like to add very quick, if possible. Okay. I just want to ask something that it can be outside of the agenda. Just very quickly, um, Mr. Hannon is aware, we had a complaint last week regarding people who are meeting to carpool into Markham or Toronto, and they're meeting, parking on the street, and getting tickets for exceeding the three hours. Now, I know given we're trying to get people more pedestrian friendly out of their cars, I don't know what a solution is, um, whether we've looked at any sort of municipal lots or anything like that for <coughs> carpooling. Uh, I just wonder if, if um, I don't want to ask for another report, but if, if staff have looked into this at all, or can they look into this at all a little bit, just have sort of a, some sort of blurb back maybe the next GDC on whether that's something we could look into. Because uh, to try and, and stop people from carpooling to me is the wrong thing to do because of our on-street parking bylaws. So Mr. Hannon has said this particular area, there's been five different complaints from five different sets of neighbors. So it, it is a problem. Um, I just don't know how to solve them. So would you like a report? Well, yes. I, our staff are busy. I mean, have you <coughs> looked into it yet? Or is this something that anybody has thought of at this point? Through the chair, we, we have looked into it. Without getting into great specifics, in this particular case, all three people carpooling are Ajax residents that are driving from their Ajax homes to a specific street and leaving them on the car. So. Oh. That's three additional vehicles on the street. Mm -hmm. By appeasing one resident, if we came up with a resolution or a change in the traffic bylaw that said that they could do it for carpooling purposes, how I'm not even sure we would administer that. Mm -hmm. We're making several other streets or residents on the street mm -hmm. upset regarding the amount of vehicles. Even in this case, I may have looked at the, the matter differently had it been an issue where people from outside our municipalities were coming into carpool, but when all carpooling people are within, we even suggested that perhaps it would make more sense for somebody to rotate the houses and pick up. Um, the individual was non-responsive and rather agitated at the time. <laughs> I, I just think that no. the more... It, the on-street parking issue is becoming more and yep. more of a concern. The streets are getting narrower and narrower. And I, I'm not suggesting that we have any kind of on-street parking permit for carpooling. That is not what I'm suggesting I, at I all. think we could more than, than happily look at some town facilities that may be not utilized extremely well during the daytime hours, but there are specific events where maybe the McLean Community Center may fill up 
um, that there's going to be some form of requirement. We can look into that and report back to council. I don't. We're working on four other projects currently. I would say at the earliest it would be mid no, mid October to the end of October before we can report that. Okay. I, I would just be interested to see what the feasibility would be on, on having a municipal lot for carpooling purposes. You know, maybe somewhere along Roslyn, Taunton, wherever. Um, and see where we go. And again, I don't know in this particular case that would help because they still would be required to put, bring their vehicles to that location yeah. to, to an issue. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. There's no departmental reports. I need a motion to adjourn. You got it. Um, oh, I just want to. Uh, we have a little problem in that the photograph <coughs> when the bomb girls came out to council, obviously council broke the camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only photograph that didn't turn out. There was a problem. Were with you the in 